are in the ninth chapter of Nehemiah. And I would have to say this is quite a lengthy prayer. Um, we're going to call it maybe one of the longest prayers in the Bible. And what's so incredible about this prayer, as I've taught through the lessons, is <clears throat> from the fifth verse of the ninth chapter begins this, what I've called, a mosaic of prayer, essentially reflecting back on all the goodness and all the ways the Lord led the people. What's remarkable is we go from creation to Canaan, really just in a flash. That's pretty remarkable right there. As if, as I've said, the ones who were praying didn't even bother to pray about Adam and Eve. Who, who cares about them when you've got God starting over with a man he calls out of Ur of Chaldees, or Kazdim, as I've said, referring to the Hebrew. So we go from that, and as we navigate through these verses, this is what is quite amazing. Everything here is God-centered. Every verse tells us about what God did in his fidelity, in his faithfulness, faithfulness, and the failure of the people in general, and we could take that into the New Testament and we could apply it again. But I'm looking at the verses beginning at verse 9 and all the way through to verse 15. So beginning at verse 9, speaking of God, that he did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, heard us their cry by the Red Sea, and show us signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants and upon all the people of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So didst thou get thee a name, as it is this day. Thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou ledest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger. I'm going to stop right there. If you read over um, some verses later, it says also the end of verse 20, and withheld us not thy manna from their mouth, gavest them water for thirst. Forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, their clothes waxed not old, their feet swelled not. So what I want to pick apart here although it really has little or nothing to do immediately with Nehemiah. It has much to do with something that, when I read this, I said, I, I, I got to stop there. So if you're bored and you don't like what I'm doing today, tough, right? <laughs> I think a lot of times what happens is these passages that are recalling the history of God's people, they are most commonly known, and therefore we form opinions somehow that these are either non-applicable or we take the lessons we'd like to take. But what I am highlighting from this passage in Nehemiah is the fact that God came down and spoke to these people, and the, the, the one who is speaking this prayer says, and spoke to them from heaven, and made known to them. And we tend to think that God's way of teaching his people was strictly by giving them laws and commandments, but God taught them another way. And that is really what my lesson is about today, because if you pay close attention to the lesson that God taught for those people, the children of Israel, and these people are including this in their prayer, which means they understood something about God's nature, and we might carry it all the way through into the New Testament, I think we'll have something um, to walk away with chew on as soul food. How do you like that? So, um, first of all, let me highlight two things. If you want to underline in your Bible the fact in verse 13 when it says, and he spake, spakest with them from heaven, 
And the other thing to underline is gave us them bread from heaven. And this event is chronicled for us in Exodus 16. So if you'd like to turn there with me, that's where I'm going today, Exodus 16. And I would like to point out a few things as we uh, get into this lesson. I'm trying to say that God had more than one way to teach the people. It wasn't just thou shall and thou shalt not. But he taught them by the manna. And the lesson of the manna is hugely important. Now, it's pretty evident that most of these people did not learn the lesson. It's unfortunate. But there, there are things that we can know. Um, let's go back a little bit. While you're in Exodus 16, let me reflect on something that's happened in the verses that were the chapters that just came before. God has brought them out of Egypt, and they have gone through the sea that was parted, dry land. Their enemies, as we read in Nehemiah 9, thrown into the water. God takes care of your enemies. That's great. And as the waters close up and they begin to journey, the first place they come to is the place where the water was bitter. This is probably the most um, simple thing one could observe, but the vast majority of Christendom teaches you when you are delivered, when you come to God. God will make everything sweet, but where, where's the first stop? Bitter waters. And I like that because it says that I'm not crazy and neither are you. It tells me that that's what did I say? Spend time in this word and you begin to see patterns. God is not and has never been in the uh, method of delivering people by simply taking them and transporting them that they might not know the trials and they might not know the bitterness and the harshness of life. So the first stop, the bitter waters. And of course, God instructs Moses to fell a tree that sweeten the waters as a type of Christ. All of this in the Old Testament points to Christ, but there's something about this particular journey that strikes me. You notice, after they've been delivered from Egypt, and as I said, the miracles, I had to go back and count how many miracles. Do you know that by the time the people are led out of Egypt, if you count the miracles, depending on how you count them, I count to the day, to the time of their exodus, there are at least 21, and depending on how you count, 25 miracles to the day that they exit um, Egypt. That's a whole lot of miracles. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen that many miracles in my life. So if I was seeing that, um, my reaction probably would not be uh, what begins here in chapter 16. Um, they took their journey from Elam, all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, which means this is just a few weeks after they've exited. It's not too great of a distance between the exodus, which marks the first Passover, and this chronology, which is given. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now listen. There are plenty of preachers that listen to me. Take comfort. You're not the only person that people complain about. You'll always find an example. It's, it's unfortunate, but you'll always find an example of, of the folks who are ungrateful. They can't figure out. Moses wasn't perfect. Aaron wasn't perfect. Nobody that God has chosen except Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh, who came in the likeness of sinning flesh, but knew no sin. No one is perfect. And what I love about this is, after all these great miracles, after this great deliverance, they're murmuring against Moses and Aaron. And eventually they will just, get, they'll cut to the chase and begin murmuring straight Godward. But right now, just against Moses and Aaron, as if, by the way, they come, came up with the idea of leading the people out their way, right? Okay, just, just saying. The children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and we did eat of the bread to full. Now listen, you brought us out into this wilderness to kill us. I wish I could just 
make this my lesson for the day and not talk about the other lesson I have planned because this one really is what I see the most. People who come into the church, they're broken, they're, they're, they're bowed down, life has eaten away at their vitality and everything else that you can itemize. And then they'll hear a word, they'll get comforted for a while, and then when everything well, what have we said? You come to God and all hell's going to break loose on you, right? When everything's looking like the hand bucket that hell should be in, that seemingly now is in your life, you want to turn around and say, what did you do that for, right? Well, these people are saying the food that they ate in Egypt was infinitely better. And I love the fact that they are murmuring against Moses and Aaron, and it says that God heard, and God said, the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. I'm going to cause bread to come down from heaven. And the people should go out and gather at a certain rate every day. Here's the catch, that I may prove them. I'm going to prove these people. Now, you remember we studied this word. It's the same word being used that's used in Genesis 22 when it says, And God tested or tried, or tempted Abraham concerning Isaac. It's the same word. That is, if you take it into the Greek, reading the Septuagint, piraso, I've taught on that word before. And that is an important part of this lesson, which is God said he's going to rain down bread from heaven for you. The people shall go out every day, gather a certain rate that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. God gives instructions and says, even for the Sabbath. They won't go out and gather, but on Friday they'll gather twice as much in preparation, and what they gather will be enough. Moses and Aaron said to the children of Israel, even, then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. <laughs> Guys, you're not complaining against me, you're complaining against him. I've told you this many times. That should be the quintessential lesson for the church. Too many people come in and they complain about the pastor and they complain that well, the pastor's not doing this and the pastor's not doing that and their idea of what the pastor ought to be doing. And too bad, many pastors end up like Aaron under the influence and pressure of the congregation and trying to please the flesh and building an idol of a molten calf of their making. That's many pastors today because they can't figure out that if God called a person into the pulpit, frail and faltering as they may be, they are called to deliver the word of God, not cater to the flesh, not make you feel good, but educate you and make you come to know, as the New Testament says, about the one true living God and Jesus Christ, his son, whom he hath sent. So, don't feel bad when they murmured against Moses and Aaron. It's just spun back around, for he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And I love this. He says, and what are we that ye murmur against us? And that's what I've said constantly. From the pulpit on festival, I've said, anybody who begins to complain about me or about my teaching, you need to just sit down and listen, because that's part of the problem. You're doing too much, way too much talking spending too much time criticizing, sitting in judgment. And the New Testament makes it very clear. The Apostle Paul spells it out. God gave some, and he lists the gift ministers to the church for the perfecting of the saints and not the other way around. Too bad Moses didn't say, God, blot them out, because God was ready to blot them out, and he pleaded and interceded for them. Lord, don't do that. Please don't do that. The people will hear and, and see, and they'll say that you brought them out, but essentially, what did you bring him out for? Now, I've confessed to you, there have been times where I've said, God, <laughs> I won't tell you what I prayed. Well, a very wise person said, we love the church, the only thing that's wrong with it is the people. <laughs> but see, the Lord loved us before we loved him, so he must know what he's doing, right? That's what I said. All right, so this is what Moses and Aaron 
Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. Get that. You murmur a little bit, and you get bread. Don't try that. Came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread. Something about bread that God really likes. Did you notice that? Have you noticed that God likes the bread? (laughs) What does God say to Adam when he curses him? You can eat bread all your life. Where's the town from which Jesus comes? Bethlehem, house of bread. Something about this bread. When the brothers of Joseph, famine hits the land, they don't say, where can we buy milk? They say, where, where can we buy bread? And even the disciples asking Jesus, where can we buy bread? So God really likes bread for some reason. Straight through the book, you'll be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. It came to pass that at even the quails came up, covered the camp in the morning, the dew lay round about the host. Now, it's very important that you see this. There's subtle things in here. The dew came first, the quail, then the dew, Then the dew goes up, and then the manna comes down. Seemingly, the dew comes, and then the manna. I don't know if it was instantaneous, but that's how it appears to me. The dew first, then the manna. Verse 14 says, And when the dew that was laid was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness lay a small round thing, as small as a hoarfrost on the ground. And the children of Israel saw it. They said to one another, it is manna, really, literally. What is it? What is this thing? The what you call it? What is this? For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord God had given you. Anyway, here we get to the good part. God says, This is how much you will get to go out and collect. Each one has to go out and take it and collect it. And think about this. For 40 years... This supply did not fail. Forty years, now they had other food in the wilderness, but for 40 years this supply did not fail. And when I think about that, I think about 40 years, you would think that 40 years being a complete time of testing, that somebody would have said, I get it, we can depend exactly on God to supply, as the New Testament says, all of our need, that we can trust him that he'll take care, that he sees our need, not just our bellies, but the other lessons which I want to talk about regarding this manna. But it seems like, of course, we know the manna stopped when they entered into the promised land. We know that God said he would provide for this time, and then it would cease, and exactly as he said it would. What is remarkable to me, and I said this is a rather simple lesson, but if you think about it, for 40 years... They moved around. They weren't in one place. And for 40 years, God knew exactly where to rain the manna. Now, that seems to be a no-brainer, but when you, I think when we read this, again, get into the habit of maybe caricaturing things, God knew exactly where they were in their journey when they doubled around and they came back over the mountain, went back that away. That's where the manna fell. Every time they moved the camp, that's where the manna fell. You'd think after all these years, somebody would have come to the conclusion that God is not only a God of fidelity and and a faithful God, but he is and was indeed with them everywhere they went, the whole journey. Okay, well, that seems to be a simple lesson. How about the fact that God said you'll gather, and you won't gather too much or too little? In other words, this is how much you get. And each person brings the amount they've collected, and they bring it to their tent, which means they, they had to consume this bread. Now, I've said there, there was other food in the wilderness, but you'll understand why I'm doing this, because we're going to go into the New Testament, and I want to show you how God's shadow and type of something, he was making a point, and it wasn't about people's bellies, knowing our frame and knowing the way we are. We always tend to miss the lesson that's right in front of us. The psalmist says, can God furnish a table 
in the wilderness? And the answer from this book is, of course. And you can do it anywhere. The interesting thing is that, as I said, the lessons being taught, the manna went, the manna fell in close proximity. They didn't have to go to the next town. I love God's sense of humor. If I was God, I would have said, hey, I'm going to feed you with manna. I'm going to dump out something that looks like the size of four or five football fields. You guys can schlep it around for 40 years. I'm not going to bother. One time meal, you carry it around. That's what I would have done, right? But God knew if he did that, that would probably turn into uh, covetous, even if he made it to last. See, the, the manna that they took every day, they had to consume it every day, and if they didn't, it went rotten. They couldn't keep it over. It would stink. They couldn't gather it on the Sabbath. In fact, one guy goes out and says, well, there is nothing, right? There is nothing. So God laid out this plan, and he was teaching them. Instead of the rumblings of the law, the thou shall and thou shall not, he was teaching them through the manna. Now, it does take spiritual eyes to see and these people were receiving teaching every single day. I say not through the thunderings of the law, although they received the law at the hands of Moses and they received precepts, commandments to understand God's ways. But this manna taught them the lesson of God's way with man, that he would provide. Think about the manna. He didn't have to respond. They were in the wilderness, but we know they had other food. They left Egypt, it says, spoiling their neighbors, their Egyptian neighbors. That means they not only went out with silver and gold, but they went out with cattle and whatever type of uh, livestock. So they had provision. And yet they said, oh, would to God we would die right here rather than we're missing the food of Egypt. Give us that food. And when God rained down this manna, and there's a description of what the manna looks like, that it was round. I like these God is in the detail things here. It was round. If you think about it, it had no jagged edges. There was nothing rough about it. It's a very simple message you could say. Well, round like as in no beginning and no end. Yep. It was white, symbolizing God's purity. It was a gift from God. We could talk about the fact that it's referred to in Numbers as humble bread, which makes me think of Christ's description in Isaiah 53. Nothing really too much to look at. And yet, each man, each person collected, and it was sufficient for them. It, it filled their bellies. It did not fill their spiritual needs, but it filled their bellies. Now, if you go through this lesson. There were other things that were being taught. God wanted to instruct them about his Sabbath. I think many people miss this lesson, and it's a, it's a very easy one to get, that God was not emphasizing the Sabbath as people understand it today, but the Sabbath represented recognizing the God who created everything. The Sabbath for God, saying, keep my Sabbath, was to remind the people of what the Sabbath originally was. God created everything, and then he rested. It was to bring people back, not to commemorate a day for them to rest, but to commemorate a day of what God has done. If you think about it, this great utterance of people understanding they will not work and they will not gather, we well, sit around, and if you don't work and you don't gather, what do you do? Well, in that day, you won't be talking, you wouldn't be talking about the latest stories on Twitter or whatever tweets, you would be discussing things perhaps, and not too many things, but probably your family, the people within the village, the ladies probably gossiped, and God, what God had done, how God appeared, the goodness of God. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that by creating that emphasis, God was forcing these people back to a recognition of his power in all creation. So we tend to get hung up sometimes when we talk about this, and I think there's a bigger lesson in there. Now, you have this instruction which is given. They are to not take more, and they are not to try and keep it over. Uh, verse 20 says, Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses, because they were told to not keep 
over and above what they had, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. They gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, sufficient, and each day, day by day. Now, if we were only talking about filling the people's bellies, God did provide manna, quail, water out of a rock, or sweetening the waters. And none of, none of what I'm saying would, I think, at least for me, I would be looking at this if I was part of that group of people, thinking, this is pretty incredible. If you think about it, a free gift, undeserved, unmerited, no one could work for it. But each person had to appropriate for themselves, that is to take it, which is why I believe when I quote, taste and see that the Lord is good, there's that concept right there, that bread is only bread, and bread first for the stomach and then for the soul, but it remains just bread until it's appropriated each person for themselves. Now, I've told you this. I think this series is covering the concept of God's sovereignty and election in a very subtle way because that's always a big topic in churches. People like to polarize about what election means. But I've said God is sovereign. He can call who he can. He can make those who have ears to hear, hear. Or he can take a person who is like one born out of due time, turn them around and give them the capacity to hear at a set time. So these people were exposed to all the greatness of God, including, by the way, seeing when this manna they collected would go bad, because God said, don't, through the mouth of Moses, don't collect more than you need. And the lessons are pretty simple. God's sufficiency, that he's enough. The quantity, they did not lack. Um, this also talked, this lesson about provision. And let me say later on in the book, when we encounter the widow of Zarephath, her provision, miraculous provision, was still based on what she had, not the same type of provision as these, whereby the manna was rained down for them. If you want to talk about other people who were provided for, like Elijah, who was fed by the ravens, that came to an end at a certain point, and something else was provided. But here, the miracle is, this manna was not anything that was produced except by God. There's the difference between even the miracle of Jesus feeding the multitudes that was still the boy bringing bread and fish that he had in his possession. Now, who knows? I always like to have these sidebars. Maybe that bread and fish was already miracle bread and fish. That's what the skeptics would say. It was a magic trick. Do another one. Do another one. But... What I'm saying is this was a miracle unlike any other, provision like any other, and it taught, as I said, some very clear lessons. No one was too rich, no one was too important or of the lesser side, not important enough. Um, God made sure that everybody had, and 40 years worth. And you might be saying, um, go back to that one word that I may prove them. And clearly, these people failed the test. And you might say, that's a cruel thing to say. God was the one that said, I'll rain down bread, and what? That I may prove them, whether or not they will walk in my law or no. That doesn't say whether they will keep it. Distinguish between being able to keep, which no man was able to keep the law in its entirety, versus walking, essentially at least going in God's direction and towards God. None of these were able. The the, uh, history of these people is kind of not so good. It, it's not as though if we were to take the total population, uh, chronicled for us somewhere between 600,000 at minimum and maybe up to 2 million people at maximum who could not get the lesson. Now, in the Old Testament, this lesson certified essentially taking care of the stomach, teaching the lessons as I've just outlined, all of these things that God can provide, that God loves his people, God cares for his people. And then you suddenly take this same lesson, which, by the way, is mentioned in Nehemiah, in the prayer of Nehemiah, in that ninth chapter. Interesting, I want you to go back at some point and read everything that's mentioned in there. The fact that God spoke from heaven and he rained bread from heaven says these were very special people. 
but they were a chosen out people, first oracle people, if you will, the children of Israel. Now you fast forward into the New Testament and you encounter the concept of bread still will be everywhere. As if God was saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? What's the first thing that happens after Jesus is baptized and he goes into the wilderness, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and is tempted by the devil? And the devil says, turn these stones into bread. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I ask you a question. Wasn't that the lesson that God was trying to teach them in the wilderness? Because if you read the summary in Deuteronomy, that's exactly what God was saying. He was saying, listen to me. There's more than just your belly to be fed. There's your soul. Now, into the New Testament, as I said, you find these references. Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, and he says, when you pray, our Father, which most people label as the Lord's Prayer, but it is the disciples' prayer. Jesus never prayed that prayer. His prayer is in John 17. But that prayer talks about, give us this day our daily... Good, I'm glad that you didn't say milk. <laughs> so there is a concept of God saying, I will be for you sufficiently. What's ironic is 66 books declare God's provision and God's sufficiency and God's fidelity and God's care and God's love. And one of the reasons why I began to highlight this and I realized I don't want to pass this by. If what I understand to be true is true about the Old Testament and the New, you can only really come to know about God and His ways through spending time in His Word, an understanding that God wants to nourish hungry souls. Jesus says, don't worry about the food for your belly. That's not saying, hey, if you go without food, that's not a big deal. But he's saying, worry and strive for the things that do not perish. He was speaking of himself and the word of God. Now, I want to juxtapose these two events, what we just referenced in Exodus 16 and what is also in Numbers 11 with what happens in John 6, if you'll turn there. It's as though God was saying the whole way, I will unfold my word and I will make it eventually clear as the manna was only for the children of Israel, as the manna was simply for a time. John 6. Now this is just before Jesus feeds the 5,000. And Again, if I was preaching something else, I'd, I'd do the infamous message on Philip asking, uh, on Jesus asking Philip, where can we buy bread? But if you read, verse 6, he says, and this he said to prove. That's our same word we found in Exodus 16. This he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So again, we're going to see a different type of testing, not the one in the wilderness, but again, again and again, Christ is essentially wanting to see, did they get the message? Did they understand what I'm about? Will they come to me? Will they rely on me? Because that was the basic thing was, uh, you remember Philip's answer comes in the next verse when he says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. This isn't enough bread. This isn't enough money for bread. Are you kidding? So... Jesus asked him the question to prove him, to see what he would say. The, great, the best answer would be, Lord, uh, you can make it enough. But there wasn't that connection just yet, even though these had seen mir great miracles already. If you keep reading, after the multitude is fed and the fragments are taken up, and there's over, <laughs> there's leftovers, um, after that, Jesus walks on water. Now I'm fast-forwarding to... Let's we'll start at verse 25 of the 6th chapter of John. It says, After the event of feeding the 5,000, after Jesus has walked on water, if that wasn't enough, right? And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? When did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, 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 I say unto you, 
you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Remember earlier, before he walks on the water, they wanted to make him king because he fed the people. They weren't thinking about king as in Messiah. Make him king. He's going to be our meal ticket. He'll provide for us. That's, you've got to read between the lines, and that's right there. They wanted to make him king so that he could be provider of free food. And he says, wait a minute. You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and you were filled. Here is a key. He says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might, I emphasize we, work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God that ye believe, literally that you faith on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then? that we may see and believe what dost thou work. D Jesus, do another trick. Now, this is a caution to some people who listen to me who are not well-versed in the Bible. The reason why you need to learn this word and learn it well, if you're even at all remotely interested about God, is because the spirit of Antichrist, which is already at work, which is spoken about by you read it in several of the, what are called the pastoral epistles. But when Antichrist comes, we're going to have a great depiction, if you will, in the end times of great miracles, and people will be amazed. People will be, it says even the very elect will be deceived. They will fall for the miracles, which is why it's important that you and I study this word to understand there are certain things that God is more worried about than performing tricks on cue for you and for me to come to the faith. Now, I've said many times, this is part of the problem of what I see going on in many churches. People are so caught up in the sensationalism of what you can be today and what God is going to do for you now that there is no breath of eternity, there is no bread for eternity, and there's not even a thought of when it comes to the end, will people even recognize the one, Antichrist means pseudo, false Christ. Will they even recognize this? Because if they're so readily uh, going to run for a miracle, so they're telling Jesus, if you are who you really are, prove it. Do something else. Our fathers did eat man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I want you to watch what Jesus says because it, it's not subtle at all. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send to you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Moses didn't feed you. How dare you? He says, Moses didn't feed you. What did I just quote from Exodus 16? I believe it's in the fourth chapter. God spoke to Moses saying, I will rain down bread from heaven. These people, again, it's one of these traditions that make void the word of God or uh, bad teaching, bad theology, bad doctrine. He says, no, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Even if you want to attribute it to Moses, you can't. And that manna, people still ate it and died. This bread, Eat of it and you'll never die. You'll never be hungry and you'll never die. Is the promise of partaking now. These, this um, area of scripture was tremendously, we call it rested, twisted. With, and during the period prior to the Reformation and even straight through the Reformation where the concept of eating and drinking the flesh of God became the doctrine of transubstantiation which I'm going to tell you right away, anytime anybody has any question about that, sit down and read carefully because it's the very thing that Satan managed to do is managed to trip people up so that they would stay latched on to a literal meaning and fail to see the spiritual food that God did provide. We'll talk about that another time. I don't want to get off track. But... 
Verse 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. In other words, the manna was for the children of Israel. The manna wasn't for some group of people in India. The manna wasn't for the people in some other place. It was for the children of Israel in the wilderness. That was wilderness food. Strictly for the children of Israel, this manna, which is the true bread, is food for the world. That's why I said you, you see that God was trying to teach something that those people did not understand. And then this is why the beginning of John says, he came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as could hear, could come to him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Hey, we'll hang out with you if you give us free food. They're still hooked on the free food thing. <coughs> Listen, I'm not against people doing charitable things, but this is not what he was talking about. He even says that at the beginning, that verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Soul food, that is the true soul food. Go for that food. Quest after that. Even the prodigal, let me just say this to you, even the prodigal, when he came to his senses, he said, in my father's house, there's bread enough to spare. You think God likes bread, right? He really, really likes bread because that's what John 3.16 is. He really likes bread. He gave his only begotten son, that's the bread. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth, faileth, trusts on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And every time I'm saying the word believe, it is the word pisteo, a verb to, to trust in, sometimes the noun form of pistis, not strictly limited to believe, but putting one's weight completely upon, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I, I will in no wise cast out. This is why I told you I go and preach to people everywhere and as much as I can, because only God, here, here we go with election, only God knows whose are, who's are his. I can't know that. I don't know the heart. I can only go, when I leave here, I can only go back in my office or go home and pray that somebody heard beyond the words. A few weeks ago, I was talking about this with the staff, and I said, why is it that preachers come under this? Well, they've got, they got to be more motivating, and they've got to say things in a way that gets your attention. But what is this but the last will and testament of God? And last time I checked, when you go hear the last will and testament of your loved one, you're not checking to see if the lawyer sounded really great or if he was emotional, if he was blowing his nose or if he was smoking or if he was high. You're listening to hear what was in the will. That's what this is. What's in the will? <laughs> Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That's a bold statement right there. That should solidify for those people that say, well, I'm going to lead somebody to the Lord today. Well, the Lord can open up eyes and ears and position you at the right time, at the right place to be the conduit. But you know why they say you can't make a horse, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. That's exactly that. You, you must be hungry to eat this bread. And, and when I say hunger of the soul, I'm talking about you have exhausted. Now, not, this is not true of everybody, but certainly true of me. I exhausted every method of, of trying to be okay. And suddenly you find out that I had, my soul was so hungry that I was essentially dying of hunger. Not, we're not talking about my size. We're talking about my condition, my soul. And it's remarkable when when we come to understand the difference about people saying, yeah, I'd like to know about God, which says I'm still not hungry for that bread, versus I want to know everything I can know. That means I'm hungry to eat this bread, and this bread gives life, and this bread has the power to give life. So 
Jesus says, I came down from heaven. Remember I quoted the passage out of Nehemiah where it says he spake from heaven and he rained down bread. Here we have in the New Testament the Son of God coming down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again for the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me. This is the most important thing here, that everyone which seeth the Son, and here is a verb, and faiths on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now the Jews then murmured at him. There's a pattern of people constantly murmuring when God is declaring something of this nature. They murmured because they didn't murmur, by the way, at the miracles when he fed the multitudes. They didn't murmur when somebody said, hey, this guy walked on water. But they murmured when he said, I'm the bread of life. Uh, that I don't understand. But what I want you to see is if you keep reading, in verse 48 he says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat men in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And that's why I said this is John 3.16. What's interesting about this is that these folks that are praying in Nehemiah, whoever is praying this prayer and referencing God coming down to speak to the people and raining bread from heaven, they don't yet know because Christ has not yet been revealed, he has not yet come in the flesh, that all of these things symbolized in one way or another a shadow and type of a better thing, which is what Hebrews talks about, a better thing to come, which was fulfilled in Christ, and how, exactly how Hebrews opens that at different times, in different ways, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets. Moses was a prophet. And in these last days has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And the glory of this is that these people in Nehemiah didn't know what we know. But we're looking at this now, and I can say caught somewhere right in the middle between Moses' band, Exodus 16, Numbers 11, straight through to Nehemiah, straight through the book of John, and you see that God realized that people, A, not all people had an appetite for spiritual things. It's one thing to say we all have a need for food, but not all could receive this food. And the lesson that I want to leave with you, which I think is probably one of the simplest lessons, but one of the more profound ones, I cannot make people have an appetite for this bread. I can talk to you about the love of God. I can talk to you about how God fixes the broken, how he heals the sick, how he claims and says he will raise the dead. I can talk to you about the things that happened on a hill called Calvary. I can tell you all of that and I can say, this is that. But I cannot make you come and eat of the bread. And bread that is not consumed remains bread. And I'm not talking about a bread somehow that changes. I'm just talking about Christ now. Bread that is unconsumed, the soul stays hungry, the soul stays impoverished, and the bread eventually, that bread that is pushed away, as I said, it's hard to make people have an appetite. Now, many other churches and many other ministries, and I'm specifically talking to those people who are relatively new to this church, will tell you you must make a journey to the altar. You must come and accept Christ. You must say the sinner's prayer to be saved. And by the way, I always say that those are the most damaging things because I not only not, I, I do not find a sinner's prayer, I find many sinners praying in this book, but the only thing that I find are people who one day wake up and they realize that the misery of the soul, like the children of Israel who were crying out, they were crying out in a wilderness place. They were crying out in misery. Could be met with God's attentive ear taking care of his creation. And the appetite for this food does not come in one moment at an altar. The appetite for this food comes. 
You know, when you spend time with God and you study God's word, you not only learn about God, you learn about yourself. And you learn about your wretched state. I learned about my wretched state and my state of being that without that spiritual food, I cannot exist. Oh, I can have my existence out in the world. But a changed being, the New Testament talks about being a new creature in Christ Jesus. But you can't become a new creature by saying, I'll entertain this, I'll look at it. You approach God, you learn about God, you learn about yourself, and you realize without this food, without this bread, I have no hope. Now, it's a very simple lesson. The people in Nehemiah's day, they didn't think about that. They just saw the provision that God took care. Not only did God lead his people out of Egypt's bondage, and not only did God divide the sea and swallow up the enemies and sweeten the waters and struck a rock, or in one case where he was, Moses was told to strike the rock and the next to speak to it and flub that up pretty bad, cost him the promised land or entering into the promised land. But the point is that God, the lesson for those people was that God would see his creation through and God would be enough. God is sufficient, that no one lacked. Part of the, the trouble, I say, with Christianity today is that most people do not have an appetite for this bread. They want something that is either so complicated and so complex that a baby cannot digest it, or they want something, what Paul warned about, a gospel which is not another gospel. There's only one gospel. There's only one bread. There's only one source of life depicted for us, given to us, revealed to us in the New Testament, and that is in Christ Jesus. Now, a preacher comes and says, okay, if you've heard the message, and if you're ready today to make that commitment, now, if somebody asked me that question, you know what I'd say? Hell no. <laughs> not, not, not because I want to say hell no, but because there's never going to be a time because we live in the flesh. Our mouth goes. I see, I've seen this over the course of my life as a Christian, of people making commitments. You've seen them too, by the way, over the years. Ministers who tried to paint themselves as so perfect and so exact, and they were preaching behind a mask. And behind that mask was lies and deception, sex scandals, money scandals, everything that you can imagine. I remember when people used to talk about Dr. Scott, and they'd say, oh, he's got a foul mouth, and he smokes a cigar, and I'd say, in your face. In your f Hear me out. In your face. That is, he never tried to conceal anything. He said, this is who I am. Now, God didn't call him to wear a white suit of perfection. He called him, yeah, he called him, he called him to preach the gospel and to deliver the word, just like Moses who said, what am I going to say and how can I speak? And all the other people right down to this container here called Melissa Scott, same thing. Don't make a mistake and think somehow that these testimonies that people make should be what we base our faith on. The same many, in fact, not just one, but I'm thinking about three different ministers who were very famous. Their testimony was that they were pure and they preached perfectionist doctrine for their listeners to be pure and to live a pure and righteous and holy life. And then it was discovered that these were living lives of hypocrisy, condemning others, but yet behind the scenes living as frauds and fake, condemning other people, not only did it cause a lot of people to fall away from the faith, but it managed to accomplish its purpose, which is to make many people be very reticent to even approach the things of God because it all must be hypocrisy. It all must be a sham. Anybody who has a program on TV must be a charlatan. And I come back to you and say, this is why you cannot place your trust in a man or a woman in the pulpit. You must trust that God's Spirit is operating through that one to deliver the Word of God, love the Lord, latch on and get to know His Word so you won't be duped. And let no one condemn you that somehow, if you, if you should behave this way or you should do this, that altar call, all that does is put a giant target on somebody's back. I would say the devil already knows the ones who, who step forward in their heart before they even step forward to the front of the room. But what it does is those great testimonies. The devil takes pride 
in soiling them as quick as he can. So the one that came forward that said, I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner, but from this day forward, I will walk with the Lord, and I will keep his law, and I will be holy and righteous, is the same one that you'll find about six months from now, or maybe a year from now, being pulled out of a bar by the cops, or shooting up someplace. And that's why I said we don't do those types of things here. I teach you about God. I teach you if you have a hunger, if you know you're broken, then you know you're broken. If you know that you are a sinner, then you know you're a sinner. The definition of sin is not what you say or what you eat or how you act. It's a condition that started in Adam that hasn't changed, and the only way to change it is coming to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And when we know that about him, when we understand what he did at the cross, shedding his blood to die for a sinning and lost world, then we can begin to understand the way that God makes possible is the way of faith. And his provision? I'm not going to tell you that God's going to give you bread now, home-baked bread or garlic-flavored bread. I know you're starting to get hungry right now. <laughs> But I'm telling you, the bread that God's going to give you is going to be just like I've described for those who are in bitterness, for those who are in grief, sweetness to the soul, comfort, and understanding that if you've never known what it is to be needed and to be loved, once you get into this book, you understand, I'm loved and I have a reason to get up every day, and that reason is found in the bread of life called Jesus Christ. The people in Nehemiah's day didn't know what we know, but thank God we have these great and precious promises to the soul that is hungry. He says, come eat of this bread. You'll never hunger again. To the one who thirsts, I will give you this water that you will thirst no more. And those that are his that are able to hear, taste and see, Forgive me for saying this, but meditate, masticate, assimilate all of what's going on and say, the Lord has given me strength for this day through that bread. The Lord has given me provision enough for this day according to his word, according to this bread. The Lord is sufficient. And this bread, if you'll taste and see that it is, and it is good, this bread called Jesus Christ is what I'm talking about today, the promise those in Nehemiah's day didn't have, but we have. Thank God we have it. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com. Dot com.